as Alistair Gibb from Loughborough University uh, talking about nanotechnology, hero or villain. Exciting things are happening in construction and the built environment and in particular in the materials area uh, lots of innovation in construction materials. All sorts of things are coming onto the market uh, that weren't there before. Now some of these uh, have existed for a while, high strength bolts for instance, but, but what's happening now is that um, certain of these, of these products are claiming performance that wasn't achievable 10 years ago, 5 years ago or so. Self-cleaning glass, fire resistant glass, high strength welds, vacuum insulation panels and so forth. And, they're, and they're, they're claiming great things and they're achieving great things. And it's an exciting time to be involved in construction. But how do they do it? How do these materials actually achieve uh, these, this step change in performance? Well, what we've found from the research we've done so far is that the, the main reason um, that we've identified is nanotechnology. And that these new products or these changed products, the products that have come onto the market, are, are achieving this, this fantastic performance through incorporating nanoparticles uh, in, in the manufacture uh, of the product. So what are nanoparticles? Well, basically it's to do with their size and a nanoparticle is, is something where one of the dimensions of the particle is smaller than 100 nanometers. Now that's tiny. A human hair is 80,000 nanometers. So 100 nanometers is really very, very small. And what tends to happen is at that scale, things change. The way in which materials operate, the way in which materials behave uh, changes when you're working at the nanoscale. A massive growth in these areas, you'll see from this slide, uh, the consumer products uh, uh, sector, for instance, has, has seen a more than a 500% uh, increase over a few years. And they are all over the place. Acne lotions, um, stuff you put in your socks so that they don't smell, sunscreens, food supplements, uh, and, and so forth. You know, components that we come across every day, coatings, hockey sticks even, um, have, uh, have, have got nanotechnology in order to make them perform better. And it's both exciting and concerning as well. And that's the issue, really. So what? What is the issue? Um, the uh, NIOSH uh, report here, released only a few weeks ago at the start of 2014, uh, mentions this. As the field continues to expand, it's paramount that the health and safety of workers is protected. So what are the health hazards? The issue is bioavailability. How can we actually get these particles into, or how do these particles get into our our bodies. Inhalation, ingestion and dermal pathways are the three main ways. They're so tiny they can even get through the skin. And once they're there, they can accumulate, they can persist and they can translocate. Now I'm not a medic, but they are the, the words that are used to say they create problems inside our, our bodies or can create problems inside our bodies. So products that contain hazardous nanoparticles might uh, create potential health and safety risks throughout their life cycle. In the built environment, we're particularly interested in the use of uh, such products and then in the disposal, the demolition and recycling of those products. Two, two particular types of nanotechnology are flagged up as being problematic, and that's carbon nanotubes and quantum uh, dots. And you can um, uh, look across the world, even in our own country here, the Health and Safety Executive uh, in the middle of last year produced this document looking at nanomaterials at work and in particular um, carbon nanotubes and what they call high aspect ratio nanomaterials. In, and they have cited, as all the other reports do, emerging evidence of uh, toxicity. We're talking about breathing, skin to uh, contact, swallowing and the eyes, uh, get getting access to the body through the eyes. They're also trying to explode some myths as well. Um, uh, the myth is that they're all the same, that all nano is the same. Well, it isn't. Each nano, um, and even within um, types of nanotechnology, for instance, carbon nanotubes, they're different because their geometries are different. Some of them are harmful, some of them uh, less so. The NIOSH report talks about downstream, uh, uh, downstream activities that might release nanomaterials, and it includes machining, for instance. And you can envisage, I'm sure, um, that products may well be machined both during construction but also in the life cycle of, uh, of the product. 
Now, the advice that's out, that's out there in the industry at the moment is mainly for manufacturers. So they talk about laboratory fume hoods. They talk about liner product bagging systems, fantastic solutions, but not suitable for construction, maintenance, demolition, or uh, recycling. But of course, nano is a big area. And they're even using nano, for instance, to coat guava fruit so that it lasts longer before it reaches uh, the shelves of your local supermarket. And I would only hope that these types of nanomaterials have been tested adequately so that they don't uh, pose any occupational health or public health risk um, in their use. But it's a big area. The NIOSH report um, has found that evidence of control effectiveness for nanomaterial production and downstream use is scarce. So they're saying we aren't really uh, addressing this issue as soon or as, as, as adequately as we ought to be. You look at Hazards magazine, for instance, across the world over the last few years, there have been reports of all sorts of concerns being raised. But generally speaking, nothing has happened as a result of these. The, the, the take-up of nanotechnology has, has continued apace. So what are the facts? Manufactured nano, nanoparticles are becoming very common. Some are acknowledged as harmful. We need more medical research. Guidance says, well, you must be prudent, you must be careful, you must take a precautionary approach. The latest guidance from the HSE tries to identify more hazardous nanoparticles and, and give some guidance. But actually to know the difference, you need to know the makeup of the particle. You need to know its geometry. And as a buyer, you might not even know it has nano in it in the first place, let alone what type of nano, let alone what particular geometry that nanoparticle has. Nobody seems to know also um, how easily those nanoparticles can be released. How can they become bioavailable? There is no guidance on this. And that's what we're trying to find out in uh, some research done by a team from Loughborough University funded um, by the uh, IOSH uh, research group. This gives you some examples of uh, types of construction and built environment product that are likely to contain nano. Now, it doesn't mean that every, of the, every one of these products does, but any of this type of product that is promising step change in performance is likely to include na the nanotechnology. So self-cleaning cleaning glass is an example. It talks about titanium dioxide. The titanium dioxide particles used in self-cleaning glass are nanoparticles. Um, uh, and it, it, it's that sort of approach you need to take in understanding uh, where these particles are being used. And in an attempt to try and help to see whether um, all uh, particles are, are hazardous, we said before they weren't, um, but, but whether there's some sort of hierarchy, then this seems to be what the research is saying at the moment. Carbon nanotubes, quantum dots seem to be flagged up. Some of the others, the nanopolymers for instance, seem to be identified as being benign with no particular problem. But at the top of this list, you've got a problem at any dose or potential problem at any dose. But then um, further down, you've got, well, it's probably not a problem unless you have lots of them. So it's a dosage issue. And the challenge that that, that, that gives us is that we would approach each of the ends of that spectrum in a different way. In one case, we'd try to contain it and then get rid of it safely. In the other case, we'd, we'd tend to disperse it. Clearly, you need to know which end of the spectrum you are in order to know what engineering controls and management controls you apply. Report here from the European Environmental Agency, Agency last year talks about early lessons um, from early warnings and talks about decision makers. And it seems that most governments around the world, certainly in, uh, let's call them the more developed governments, are acknowledging that na nanotechnology may create a problem but they're not actually doing anything about it because they genuinely don't know what to do. And of course, you can take a look from history. Um, here's an example of uh, a, an advert for asbestos that comes from back from the 1950s. You don't need to read it to actually get the idea of it. It's fantastic. My choice is best. You know, is bestos. It's fantastic. It's going to solve all your building problems. And indeed it did. It did deliver what was promised in terms of performance. But of course, along with it, it brought a massive challenge, not just for occupational um, uh, health, but for public health. And people have been affected and are still affected. People are dying as a result of that use of uh, asbestos. And in some ways, you could compare some of the data that's around now about nanotechnology um, uh, with what was happening in asbestos in those sort of 1940s, 1950 times, where it wasn't 
absolutely clear. There was work that was being done, there were questions being asked, but it wasn't certain. And of course, the increase in use of asbestos continued um, uh, up to the 1970s and then was still a very significant increase, um, uh, sorry, very significant use uh, right the way through to the turn of the millennium. So what about nano? What's the, uh, what's the challenge? What's the situation with nano? Well, can't we ban it? Well, that would be great, wouldn't it? If we could just ban it, then that would be wonderful. But we can't. They exist anyway in nature. They can be created from normal materials just by burning or melting. So, you know, the, the, the fact that nano is there is something that we, we, we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, even though we don't realise it. And the manufactured nano is also ubiquitous. If you wanted to, you couldn't ban it. There's too much of it out there. Lay people are particularly concerned because you can't see it. That's a, that's a worry. You can't see it. You can't understand what the problem is. But it actually isn't just the size of those manufactured nanoparticles that's a problem, but it's their proportions. And that's something also that there isn't any transparency about. Now, some people like these, uh, these two authors here have made a lot of money out of scaremongering with regards to, uh, to nanotechnology. So, you know, is it all doom? Is that, is that what, we're, what we're having to say? Is that the reality? Or is the alternative, well, we're just going to ignore it? And that seems to be what many people seem uh, to be doing at the moment. The government is talking about a prudent approach. Uh, and this is prudence. And prudence is about discernment. It's about knowledge. It's about wisdom. And it's about insight. The real challenge is, I believe you can't be prudent unless you know what the situation is. You can't be prudent without knowledge. So what can we do about nano? Well, I think we should keep researching. There's lots of research going on around the world, including the work we're doing um, uh, at the moment. We need to clarify which types of nano are worse, and that's mainly uh, through the epidemiological research that's continuing. We need to know how the particles are released, and that's something that we're going to be doing in this, in this research. We need to develop methods of protection. Once we know the types of particles, how they're released, we can then look at ways of protecting people. But what can we do now? What could you do now, having listened to this, uh, this short piece on nanotechnology? Well, I think a challenge that we can address is we can find out which types of nano are in which components. We can know where they are. We can tell people where they are. For instance, we could include them in uh, the health and safety file that's handed over to the building users. It's a challenge, but it is achievable. This type of, of, uh, of investigation is possible, and it's something we're going to be trying to help people with over uh, this, these next months and, and years. A particular project I mentioned there is this one, um, funded by IOSH and looking at managing nano in construction. The first thing we're going to be doing is to catalogue the products used in the built environment that incorporate nanoparticles, to work out which type of nanoparticle is there, to equate those types of nano uh, with the, the relevant hazard that's happening in the, in the research uh, data that's being produced, and to establish, along with uh, demolition experts and recycling experts, about what techniques are likely to be used in those sectors in the future so that we can then uh, work out the likelihood of bioavailability occurring. What we're then going to do is obtain samples and test those samples to uh, replicate in the, um, uh, in the laboratory the sorts of things that might happen on a demolition site and a recycling uh, site as well. And then ultimately to produce uh, guidance for IOSH uh, and for other OSH practitioners. Now it's going to take some time. This thing can't be solved overnight in terms of this type of research, but it's something we're keen for people uh, to work with us on. It's materials research. It's not toxicology, it's not epidemiology. That work is going on elsewhere. What we're looking at is trying to apply the research that exists to the built environment in a way uh, that, 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 that people can find helpful. So as we close, why is nano worth investigating? Well, it's rapidly invading the built environment, even though we don't realize it. We don't know what type of nano is where. The research is raising health concern. Some nanos seem to be more problematic than others. It's a doses issue for some, on the others uh, it seems as though there might be a problem even at low doses. Governments seem to encourage a prudent and caution, uh, cautionary uh, approach, but don't say how. The main concentration has been on manufacturing. We don't know how easily nanoparticles become bioavailable in construction or in demolition or in recycling. It's something that's just not, um, not been done. Demolition, we've found, is the most aggressive construction phase, construction inverted commas. 
But also they'll be learning, when we look at demolition, they'll be learning for new build, they'll be learning for maintenance and repair, because if there are problematic materials, then maybe that will help focus um, uh, the, the, uh, the action on those materials in uh, different situations. If we don't know where they are, and we don't know how easily they become available, then we can't do anything. And then in the future, when we finally find out from the medical experts and the epidemiologists which are worse, and whether any of them really are um, a life-threatening, then we'll be in trouble. If we don't know where they are, we'll be in trouble. And therefore, what we're suggesting now is let's identify where these things are, let's find out how the, how the particles can become bioavailable so that we can actually be ready for when that information uh, comes through. So managing the unknown, what do we need to know about what we don't know? Nanotechnology, it's a fantastic uh, technology it is a hero in many ways. If it's a villain, we'll find out in the future, but we need to know more than we know now in order to be able to address that challenge when it comes. Thank you very much.